Hey folks, welcome back to Noonday Prayer. As always, our service begins on page 103 of your Book of Common Prayer. If you don't have your Book of Common Prayer, no problem, you can just listen along. Uh, but let's begin. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I'm deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Well, our reading today, as you remember, is a continuation of what we've been focusing on, or what I've been focusing on, which is the Minor Prophets. The Minor Prophets are the the last 12 books of the Old Testament, and they're sort of the prophetic word to Israel after generations of Israelites have devoted their lives to God and have come up short. Their lives actually don't reflect a true life of godliness, and so uh, God sends a series of prophets to correct Israel and to bring them back. And uh, none of them quite work, in fact. And that's why this is the last series of books in the Old Testament, because they're a, se- they're a prequel to the Gospels, to Jesus, the one true prophet. But before we jump to that, let's look at Amos. Amos uh, is one of the more interesting books, in my mind, of the minor prophets. And so it's, it's in some ways, a complicated message to um, distill, but I'll do my best Amos opens with a word of judgment, uh, not to the Jews, but to all of the nations around Israel. First, he points out the sins of Damascus, and then he points out the sins of Gaza, and then Tyre, and then Ammonite, the Ammonites, and then Moab. And he he would it would seem as if this whole series of condemnations is, is really directed at the neighbors of Israel and not Israel itself. Except a few chapters in, all of a sudden, uh, Amos turns his, his gaze, turns his words over to Israel. And he says this. He says, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And those are certainly harsh words, and really they're actually the harshest words uh, of the whole book. In some ways, the, the, the words that Amos in God's stead directs at all of the neighboring uh, countries are fierce, but they are, they are not as strong as they are to Israel. And this is such an interesting move because you would think that God would condemn all of the other countries he doesn't have any privileged relationship with, except it's Israel that he seems most concerned with. They are the ones who have had the worst moral failure, it seems. They're the ones who uh, Amos saves multiple chapters on pointing out their sins. And the, the, the b- most bizarre thing about this is that there's really only one difference in God's condemnation of all of these uh, cities. And it's this. Because of God's promise to Israel, it means that his punishment and his condemnation is never, ever wasted. It, It means that it's never arbitrary. It means that his singling them out, his correction, is just that. It's actually a correction. And if you are ever in a stage of life where you feel like, Uh, bad things or harsh things or challenging things are pointed out about you in your heart or in your daily life and your practices or maybe in this moment right now of our kind of cultural upheaval. If you are a believer in God, it means that none of that is ever wasted. It means God is actually shaping you into something, into someone, into some people that actually resemble him. And there's probably nowhere that reveals this most powerfully than the cross. And that, in fact, is the promise of the cross. 
When people look at the cross, it would be easy to see pointless suffering, something that doesn't need to be. And yet what we find in the cross is this gracious act of God to reveal and to shape a people into his own likeness. But it's reversed. Rather than us receiving the punishment, Jesus as our stand-in receives the punishment. And so we become like him and are corrected and shaped into his own goodness. So I pray as you think about uh, our own moment, you think about your own heart, that you would come to turn to the words of Amos, not necessarily as words of pure condemnation, but as words of hope. To close, these are uh, the words of God through Amos at the very end. This is the promise. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. That's the promise that God makes to his people, the church, and it's the promise that's guaranteed that we see in the cross. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our service continues on page 107, excuse me, 106 of your Book of Common Prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Praying together the prayer that our Lord taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Lord, we do pray for all of the members of St. George's who are undergoing uh, serious affliction. Father, we pray that they would come to see this time as a time of growth and not as a time of condemnation. That they would see their afflictions as uh, momentary in light, and that they would turn to the glory of your Son and the promised future that we have with you. Father, we're grateful that you guarantee uh, that you will keep us until the very end, and you show us that in the cross. We pray this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you, sent to your, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.